Uh, we have an extra special speaker today. Um, <laughs> not the guy with the jacket. Uh, Ambassador Keyboard Naj, who before coming to Texas Tech, where he is now the Vice President, Vice Provost for International Affairs, which is the uh, entity at Texas Tech that first of all deals with our large number of foreign students, but also works with the public schools. You've probably been involved in some of their programming. I know, you know, Kelly and uh, I participated in some of that myself. So it's a, it's a great operation. Um, ambassador Nye has been ambassador to both Ethiopia and Guinea, um, and has had considerable service uh, in, in Africa. He's also uh, of Hungarian birth, so he knows uh, Eastern Europe very well, too. He's a, a guy who really has his eye on the world scene. Uh, and when he is going to talk about Africa today, he's going to talk about it uh, with full knowledge of the, of the larger world context. So I think this is going to be a great educational experience. And uh, let me turn things over to Matt about the shirt. No, not the shirt, about a shirt. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming out after lunch. My gosh, I know what it's like. So we're definitely going to uh, make a lot of this discussion instead of, you know, me just talking about my views. But we're going to do a couple of things. Number one, I want to talk about briefly what is foreign policy. Then I want to go around the world very quickly, and look at the current foreign policy. You know, it's, it seems like the word problem has dropped out of our lexicon. People talk about issues and challenges. But some of the foreign policy questions of the day are definitely problems that we're going to be facing in the immediate and long term. And then finally, I want to talk briefly about is America up to being able to deal with all of these foreign policy problems. And then I'm going to stop, and then I'll throw it open so that we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. So first of all, what is foreign, po what is foreign policy? Books and books and books have been written about this. And to a certain extent, from my point of view, having dealt with foreign policy on the ground for 32 years, I think it's been way overcomplicated. So to me, the fundamentals of foreign policy are quite simple. It's implementing every nation's blueprint, for promoting the full range of interests around the world, full stop. I, I think that basically says it all. And as far as American foreign policy, there are some fundamental issues we have been really preoccupied with for not just since this past century, but even before then. Uh, that one with Teddy Roosevelt up in the top left corner, you know, are we supposed to be the world's constable I think goes back to 1904. So, so these, these questions have been out there. Because it really gets complicated. This is where foreign policy gets complicated. It's uh, what means are we supposed to use to advance our interests and in what combination? Because the tools at every nation's disposal, more so for us, there's always the military, there's diplomacy, there are spies, there's economic power, or lack thereof, there's propaganda, or what some people call soft power, commercial enterprises, remember what's good for GM is good for America, and of course, new technology like cyber warfare, which we've heard a lot about recently. This is one of the reasons why one of those most brilliant of all statesmen ever, Otto von Bismarck, compared making foreign policy to making sausage. That uh, the end product is something, but you don't want to be in there to see how it gets made, because it is rather messy. Now, in the United States of America, the means of foreign policy is supposed to be very clear cut. Um, I'm taking this right from the US Department of State's website. And, and this is a quote that, under the Constitution, the US President determines US foreign policy. The Secretary of State, appointed by the President, with the advice and consent of the Senate, of course, is the President's chief foreign policy advisor. The Secretary carries out the President's foreign policies through the State Department and the U.S. Foreign Service. Now, if it were only that easy, 
Exercising foreign policy in North Korea is easy, because whatever Kim Jong-un says, everybody does. But in the United States, it's just the opposite. As a matter of fact, I, my view and my experience, implementing U.S. foreign policy may be the most complicated and difficult of any country in the world. It's complicated because, number one, we have co-equal branches of government. Even though foreign policy is supposed to be the president's purview, it never is. Then we also have federalism. I remember I was in Togo and an Ohio senator showed up and trying to explain to the president of Togo what in the heck was a state senator as opposed to a U.S. senator was not at all easy. And then in the United States we have very, very loud political constituencies who support the opposing sides on almost every important political issue. Uh, I had to experience that firsthand in a number of cases, especially having to do with policies towards Israel when I was overseas. And that also, that injects a huge complication. But unfortunately for most Americans, foreign policy is not what I would call a front burner issue. It's probably not even a back burner issue. For most people, foreign policy is right off the stove until something really bad happens. And then everyone becomes concerned with it. Uh, former Secretary of State Jim Baker had a phenomenal line. He said, uh, foreign policy is like your plumbing. You pay no attention to it until something goes wrong. Then that is all you think about. And that is so true. So, in the large scheme, what are America's foreign policy priorities? Um, really good example of this was just last week when Secretary of State Tillerson was testifying before uh, Congress, and he had one, uh, one kind of good quote. He said, while our mission will also be focused on advancing the economic interests of the American people, the State Department's primary focus will be to protect our citizens at home and abroad. Our mission is at all times guided by our longstanding values of freedom, democracy, individual liberty, and human dignity. The convictions of our country's founders is enduring, that all are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. As a nation, we hold high the aspiration that all will one day experience the freedoms we have known." End quote. So, in effect, each U.S. administration, going way back, has advocated global leadership, their definition of what global leadership entails, but there's always been a tension in how do you balance hard power, the military, the spies, economic power, and soft power, human rights, push for democracy, or promoting U.S. culture. With some administrations, it's been way tilted on one side, like, of course, Reagan, some would say George W. Bush, with other administrations has been tilted on the other side, i.e. President Carter, or even President Obama, where a lot of people said that he dithered, he, he spoke eloquently, but he didn't ever really take action. And that tension is being played out right now, of course, in the current administration. So let's look at the global priorities that this administration, and probably the next one, and the one after that may have to deal with. Um, when I did diplomacy, during most of the time I did diplomacy, it was relatively simple. We had two superpowers in the world and their allies. We had, of course, the West, most of Western Europe with us, countries in Asia, some in the Middle East, and then we had the evil empire, led by the Soviet Union and, and their allies. When we had to deal with some kind of an international issue, I would go in and see the president of the country or the foreign minister and we'd deal with it that way. There was not this huge range of non-official actors that my colleagues have to deal with now, whether they're non-governmental organizations, uh, they're global corporations, they're other kind of pressure groups, uh, the media, not to speak about social media, and on and on. So, so doing foreign policy now is so much more complicated. But let's look at the major, and there's two kinds of issues that we as a country have to deal with internationally. One is what I call thematic, 
and the other one is geographic. And of course, they'll bleed into each other. That's just showing you the uh, global supply chains of some major products. You know, anyone who says that globalization is going back for, backward needs to look at the reality of how supply chains are these days. And all of that involves foreign policy. What I wanted to illustrate there was the biggest foreign policy issue facing the United States now is the transition from what I call the post-World War II U.S. enforced and created global system to what will replace it. What I'm talking about there is after World War II, we set up all the international institutions. We set up the United Nations. We did the Marshall Plan. We set up the alliances, NATO and the others. That's our system out there. That is our, it was our globe. And then all of a sudden communism ends, Iron Curtain comes down, and for about 10 years we are the sole unchallenged hyperpower. We ruled the world for a brief 10 years. And then, and then, probably since about uh, September 11th, 2001, the world is evolving totally differently. It's going towards multiple poles. Not that we're not the strongest. We're still first amongst equals, but we have to deal with others, and we'll, we'll talk about it. But what is that system going to look like? And, and I will, my view is that if we retreat now, we're making a horrendous mistake, because we will then lose the power we should have in creating that system, because it's very much under evolution. So, so let's talk about some of the forces that are promoting what I call global disorder. Because today we have global order in part of the world, North America certainly, uh, parts of South America, Europe, parts of Asia, but then we also have this huge, huge space that I call global disorder. And global disorder is bleeding into global order. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the forces. Uh, first of all, and I'm, I'm not being political here, I'm, I'm just going to say climate change. I'm not saying human-induced climate change, I have not a clue, but I have seen it firsthand in Africa and I know the terrible things that climate change is doing in Africa. And a lot of the conflicts and a lot of the, the horrible things going on in Africa right now can be directly linked to the changing climate in Africa. And, and that, of course, is going to impact the world, the coastal cities. We know how many people in the world live within 50 miles of oceans. And that, so that's, that's out there, whether we like it or not. Uh, population and migration. Um, Parts of the world are being underpopulated, parts of the world are being overpopulated. The folks coming out of the overpopulation, mostly sub-Saharan Africa, are threatening to overrun parts that are being underpopulated. And how is that going to be resolved? Europe needs people. Africa will have a surplus, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but how is that going to be resolved? Pandemics. I'll tell you guys, we really dodged a huge bullet with Ebola. You know, if, if you study what happened with Ebola, and it was this close for Ebola getting loose in Lagos, Nigeria, which has 20 million people, this close, all because of one very brave woman doctor who stopped that. If not, it could have ended up in New York, it could have ended up in Atlanta, it could have ended up in Houston, but pandemics are going to happen, and pandemics are influenced, of course, by some of these other forces. Um, ungoverned and weakly governed space. There are currently in the world about 38 that might count failed or failing states. And as we all know, if a state is not exercising government over its territory, it leaves a vacuum that is an open invitation for groups to be created like ISIS or for groups like Al-Qaeda or others to just come in. Or other groups like in Eastern Congo where you have probably 12 different insurgent groups or whatever you want to call them operating. Let's talk a little bit about terrorism specifically. Okay, that's kind of shows you that's the latest map I could I could bring up showing you the impact of terrorism and you can see that uh, you know yes the Middle East, South Asia and of course much of uh, sub-Saharan Africa is really impacted. But but here is here is what's happening. During the last several years, it's been all about the Islamic State, ISIS. ISIS actually controlled territory, 
Al Qaeda has kind of been put in the background, but I'll tell you what. People say what happened to Al Qaeda. Nothing happened to Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda never went away. Al Qaeda now, now this year, we are I think going to see the reemergence of Al Qaeda as the Islamic State kind of disappears at least from the map as a state. But the two are competing. Al Qaeda has been very smart. They have created a number of franchises, kind of like McDonald's franchises in different parts of the world. They don't call themselves Al-Qaeda. They have other names, but they have been extremely successful. I think just yesterday or the day before, they hit a resort uh, just outside of Bamako. Uh, and whether they're in Yemen, in the Maghreb, northern part of Africa, and on, these, these groups are doing very, very well. Uh, Islamic State no longer can direct operations, but they can certainly inspire them. And we see that around the world, how they are inspiring operations. They're going to lose their territory. Probably they'll lose all of it this year. But all those people who've been fighting for the Islamic State, you know, uh, you take the wasps' nest away, but the wasps are still there. And they have some place to go, whether it's their own countries or third countries. So this is going to be, in my view, a horrendous year for terrorism. And the terrorism issue is going to be around for a long, long time under whatever name, okay? Now, I thought teachers would appreciate that one. Emerging technologies. <laughs> and here I'm talking about cyber. You know, where is the border in cyberspace? There is no border in cyberspace. At least during the nuclear phase down with the Soviet Union, we had pretty firm rules and we stuck to the rules. But there are no rules in cyber warfare. And then we're seeing the after effects of that. Uh, there are no rules in space warfare. And, and that, I fear, is going to be the next one. When you compare, compare cy advances in cyber technology, the advances with robotics, the advances with drone warfare, space technologies, biotechnologies, you have a whole menu for incredible threats that we cannot even imagine right now. And in none of these fields are there really strict rules. And especially if one of the uh, international terrorist organizations gets their hands on any of these things. So those are, that's an overview of the thematic threats. So let's talk a little bit about the geographic threats. And I don't have these in any particular order except the first one, because I think this first one is the greatest threat facing not just the United States, but most of the world right now. And, and that's North Korea. I have two slides up there. One shows you the artillery range of the thousands and thousands of artillery pieces that the North Koreans have buried in the mountains along the North and South Korean border. Uh, that's on the left, and then on the right, we have the estimated range of various uh, North Korean missiles, and one which is very close to being deployed can go 4,000 to 6,000 kilometers. Until now, every American administration has kicked the can down the road. So I can blame Democrats, I can blame Republicans, they're all to blame because they had other issues to deal with, and this was very convenient to say the next folks could handle it. But we are at the point can no longer be kicked down the road. Because we are, this year, this year, if the North Koreans are not stopped, they will be able to nuclearize a missile that will be capable of actually hitting the continental United States. This year. And if that is allowed to happen, it's going to be a totally new ball game regarding North Korea. Um, they are working on a number of technologies at the same time. You know, we see in the news kind of, ha-ha, the North Koreans fired another missile, it was a dud. Don't believe it. Every dud leads to another experiment which eventually will succeed. They now can fire missiles from submarines, not very far yet. Uh, they now can fire mobile missiles, which gives us real hard burn. But, but the big one, the four to 6,000 kilometers, is going to be the deal breaker. They have 10 to 15 nuclear weapons already, and we know that. So if they're not stopped now, 
the world will enter a much, much more dangerous situation. And I'm avidly following to see how the United States will deal with it. And we can talk a little bit more about this if, if this is of interest. But this is a U.S., China, Russia problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. Okay? Speaking of China, what I have there is China's grand plan that they call the, the One Belt, One Road scheme, where they are going to be spending billions and billions and billions, and did I say billions? More billions of dollars. A network of fast railroads, ports, improving shipping lanes, all across Central Asia, South Asia, all the way to Europe. And this is why we in the United States argue about how much it will take to replace a rusting bridge. It's very sad that we have come to this point. Um, Asia's big issue is the individual countries. What is their role in the geopolitical power stru struggle, and it is a struggle to certain extent, between the United States and China? On the one hand, you have an emerging rising power. No one can dispute that. On the other hand, you have what some people call a declining power. I'm not sure about that, but, but a static power. The Chinese are also in the process of transforming their economy from export of stuff that they make to higher order, like we did services, higher order manufacturing consumers. And they're doing this extremely well. I think much better than most people thought. So Vietnam and the others are saying, we don't want to totally depend on China. We want to have the US in there, but we need China economically. But we definitely still want the US geopolitically. It's a, it's a very difficult balancing act for the countries involved. We need to manage this very, very well. The Chinese need to manage this very well. The good news, China has now become also a status quo power. Because it's in the Chinese interest to have a stable world, prosperous world, so they can sell their stuff to them, and they can keep making money. They may be Marxists, but they are capitalist Marxists. So, so China is going to be a, a huge issue. And at the same time as China is emerging, this kind of shows you Putin. And, you know, Putin win, 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 win. And he has, he's, he's, he plays his cards extremely well, not to mix metaphors, but, but the truth is that Russia is very much a declining power. Uh, I, I like to call Russia a, basically a third world country with nuclear weapons because they have an aging population, they have one of the worst death rates in the world from a whole range of illnesses. Um, Russian young people are terribly, terribly depressed over the direction that their country is, is taking. Uh, they are declining, but the problem is how are they going to decline and that has to be managed because while they are declining, they're going to be in the throes of, uh, of imperialistic uh, illustrations of bullying countries either economically or militarily or geopolitically um, and they will come uh, they will trip over China in Central Asia because Central Asia has been typically a Russian kind of uh, playground and now the Chinese are moving into there in a big way so uh, it, it's going to be very interesting how that plays out Russia could turn it around but for Russia to turn it around, they really need to have a dramatically different form of government. And I, I suspect that Putin, now, even now, is planning to change the rules so that he can run again. Because he's not in any mood to, to leave power. So managing Russia is going to be very, very difficult. And of course they try to influence our elections. That's what Russia is. <laughs> you know? Somebody said that the problem with Russia, it was Winston Churchill said the problem with, with Russia is not that she's Marxist, it's that she's Russia. You know, that, that has been Russia historically. Now Europe. I have two maps there of Europe. One is kind of the view from Russia showing what hostile neighbors they have when, when they look at Europe. And on the other side you have what's called the Schengen Zone, which are the countries in Europe that have agreed to have borderless travel, kind of like the U.S. states, which is being threatened very severely 
uh, because of the, um, the migrant crisis right now. I mean, Europe's big issues is, is the future of Europe fragmentation, like what the British are doing with Brexit, or is the future of Europe kind of getting their act together and focusing on those forces which unite them and looking at that in the future? Uh, I was very pessimistic early on when these supranationalist forces were doing so well in a number of elections, but I have been much more uh, optimistic lately seeing how it went in the Netherlands, how it went especially in France, and I think how it's going to go in Germany. Uh, the bad news, the Europeans have basically looked at the United States and said, United States, until you get your act together, we're just going to move on without you. You know, where our interests intersect fine, we'll work together, but when they don't, you do your thing, we're going to do our thing. Uh, but, the, but there are some huge issues the Europeans just don't know how to deal with. And um, one of them is migration. Uh, immigrants, being a refugee myself, do a lot much better in the United States than they do in Europe. And you can talk about the common market and uh, the uh, European Union and, and on, but Europeans are so nationalistic, so insular, uh, it's very difficult for them to assimilate people coming from a different culture. Not, not even the extent that the new arrivals are showing up, you know, a different language, different skin color, totally, you know, different cultures. I mean, Europeans have problems assimilating uh, their neighbors. I, I have a cousin who owns a factory in Switzerland, right in the border between uh, the French and German part of Switzerland. And he has to do everything in different language forms because the, the Germans and the French who live within a couple of miles of each other will not speak each other's languages. So, you know, Europe, Europe does have its problems and, and we'll see how they can deal with them. A good, good event to look at is how they're going to deal this year with all the migrants that are coming across from Libya into Italy because Italy is getting extremely fed up. But the other European countries will not take the migrants. The migrants will not assimilate into small Italian villages. So, so we'll see how that goes. South Asia. Two maps of India there. Um, the one on the right is interesting because it shows you the parts of India that are in basically permanent water deficit. So yes, it's good to be optimistic about India. They are moving forward. Uh, Economically, the current president is very dynamic, uh, but they have such fundamental, fundamental issues. The big overarching issue in South Asia is India-Pakistan rivalry. And the countries, the allies that each of them have, and the areas of friction which could go from Cold War to a hot war just about any time. But of course, the other parts of South Asia were concerned about this map of Pakistan is interesting because it shows you Pakistani nuclear facilities. Very few people realize that Pakistan has exactly the same nuclear capabilities as India. India is much larger, but when it comes to nuclear weapons, they're pretty well equal. And then the other big South Asia problem, of course, is Afghanistan. On the left, shows you areas of insurgent activity that keeps increasing. President Trump will send a couple of more thousand forces, but my question is, when 100,000 U.S. forces couldn't reverse the situation, how are we going to do it now? The Afghan government keeps getting more corrupt, losing greater touch with the people. Uh, Taliban is increasing its influence. As best I can characterize our policy is not to lose, whatever that means. We have spent probably up to $1 trillion already in Afghanistan. Your tax dollars at works, folks. Uh, I, I, I believe President Trump, being a pragmatic individual, he's going to find a way to, to declare victory and get out of there because we desperately have to. Then we get to what I call Mesopotamia, which is the Middle East, Iraq, and then over into Iran. That, that shows you the percentage of Shiite Muslim population in the various countries in the Middle East. And I'll tell you why that's significant, because that's one of the overarching issues in that part of the world. You know, don't focus just on the, on the immediate conflicts. Look at longer term. 
There's a rivalry between Shia and Sunni Islam in the whole region. Iran, of course, being the power behind the Shia, Saudi Arabia, and to a certain extent Turkey are the Sunni powers. There are also historical powers in the Middle East because if you go back, 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 there's always been an Iran. There's always been a power in Turkey, whatever you call it. And the longest lasting of it was the Ottoman Empire, which did a pretty good job of actually controlling that area much better. The big issue here is, after World War I, there was a treaty called the Sykes-Picot Treaty, where the British and the French basically created countries in the Middle East to suit themselves, not to suit the people who live there, kind of like what Europeans did to Africa, but to suit themselves. As a result, they, they set up the region for failure, eventual failure. They created royal houses where royal houses did not exist. And this is what's being scrambled right now in Iraq, in Syria, by the Islamic State. And it's an open question as to how this area, what the borders will be like when all of that finishes. The other big issue, of course, Israel-Palestine. Uh, no movement towards peace, no matter what you hear, what you read, because neither side wants peace. Two-state solution is dead. They can talk about having two states. It's not going to happen. Will not happen in our lifetime. But what, what it will be at this stage, nobody knows. All right, Latin America, I wanted to show you guys that. Could they have said in Cuba? American tourists arrive in Cuba. Yeah, they would rather have seen the army, but Latin America. Latin America, to, and to a certain extent Africa, have, have been forgotten, you know, in our foreign policy and the news coverage, and because there's only so many issues the State Department can deal with. Um, Latin America, of course, the key issues, managing our relations with Mexico and NAFTA. How is NAFTA going to come out? Yes, NAFTA needs to be updated, but how is that? Are we going to screw it up so bad that the current Mexican president is going to lose to that populist Obrador next year and Mexico will go back 20 years? Or are we going to try and be a little more delicate? Uh, we need to help Venezuela to some kind of a soft landing. Aside from that, Venezuela is going to be an absolute disaster in our own hemisphere. 1,500% inflation at last count, uh, one of the worst economic problems in the world. Then there are a number of centrist governments which have recently emerged in Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, Chile to a certain extent, a couple of other places, Colombia, and, and we should be finding ways to support them so they don't slip back into the uh, leftist popular mold. And then of course, what are we gonna do with Cuba? You know, lots of points of view on Cuba. And then Africa. The big question in Africa, the big question, which way will Africa go in the 21st century? Most of the world populations are stable, with one big exception, Africa. Uh, Africa, by 2050, is going to double in size. I was in Nigeria. They called me back to service last uh, summer to take over the embassy in Nigeria for part of the summer. And I met the, the governor of the place where Book of Aram is so active, and we were talking, and he said, he said, Mr. Ambassador, people don't know this, Nigeria, people know, is going to grow in population from 180 million this year, this now, to 360 million by 2050, displacing the United States of America as the third most populous country. What people don't realize is all of that growth is going to take part in northern Nigeria, which is Islamic, radical, women have the lowest levels of education, the fewest economic opportunities. So where are all those people going to go? They're going to go to Europe. But at the same time, when I was in Nigeria, I met with uh, returning Mandela Fellows, young Africans from all over the continent. They're here right now at Texas Tech, 26 of them. And I have never in my life met a sharper group of young people. And I said to myself, which is Africa's future? Is it Boko Haram and no economic opportunities and no education and Islamic radicalism? Or is it the Mandela Fellows who will take over from some of these African dictators that should have left 30 years ago. That is an open question, and I have no idea how it's going to go. So then, we get to the next point. Can America deal with this kind of a world? 
And my answer is, absolutely not. Without some major policy shifts, absolutely not. Why? Okay. U.S. foreign policy needs to rest on two legs, two strong legs. One is defense, and the other is diplomacy. Some people add a third leg, which is development, but I think that development and diplomacy are, are kind of part of the same strategy. Right now, one is the strongest in the world, without a doubt, the U.S. military. The other one is very much wobbly. And I would say it's not even up to the quality of some of our much lesser uh, country colleagues. Now, interestingly enough, the people who understand this better than anybody else are our military leaders. Because if you look at what some of the generals and admirals have been saying recently, they are bigger boosters of diplomacy than I am. Uh, for example, General Jim Mattis, who is now the Secretary of Defense, one of his best quotes is, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition. The more we put into diplomacy, hopefully the less we have to put into the military budget. Uh, another couple of really well-known military leaders. Admiral Mike Mullen, General Jim Jones. Our experience taught us that not all foreign crises are solved on the battlefield. In the 21st century, weapons and war fighters alone are insufficient to keep America secure. That's why we support a robust development budget to advance our national security. So military and diplomatic leaders agree on some fundamental premises, and I'll, and I'll go through these. Fundamental premise number one, handling issues diplomatically is always preferable and cheaper than handling them militarily. I don't think anybody can argue with that one. Fundamental premise number two, and if any of you guys want these notes that I'm speaking from, I'll be happy to send them to you, okay? Fundamental premise number two, traditional diplomacy is not adequate for today's and tomorrow's threats. Fundamental premise number three, the U.S. has global interests and we need to be everywhere to promote and protect them. Fundamental premise number four, U.S. State Department is structured and organized to handle the world of the 19th and the 20th centuries, not the 21st century. I applaud Secretary of State Tillerson and President Trump for wanting to say and saying that the State Department needs to be reorganized, desperately needs to be reorganized. And Secretary Tillerson is undertaking some aggressive steps to reorganize it. But, but, I think it's absolutely moronic to talk about cutting the State Department budget by 30%. I mean, that, to me, is just incredible. Fundamental premise number five. As I said, reorganizing U.S. diplomacy is essential, but cutting the diplomatic development budget already around 1% of the total by 30% is madness. So let's, let's, let's just do a quick resource comparison. Okay, that's, that's our diplomatic service. That basically we have 16,000 what we call foreign affairs employees around the world and they're part of the State Department like I was. Diplomats, they're development people, professionals, they're part of foreign commercial service to help U.S. businesses, foreign agricultural service to help sell U.S. agricultural products overseas. Uh, we have 275 missions around the world, which is quite a lot to staff. Uh, when I talk about the numbers, we have fewer foreign affairs professionals than the U.S. military has in musical bands. That's, that's the extent of the disparity. And that shows you foreign affairs budget. Sounds pretty good, 37.6 billion for, uh, for diplomacy and development. Uh, and then you compare, and we're giving 25.3 billion in foreign assistance. Uh, Department of Defense, and I'm not besmirching them, my God, but 639 billion, 2.1 million active. Civilians, our Defense Department budget is larger than the next eight countries' budgets combined. And that includes Russia, China, United Kingdom, and France. So there is a huge, huge, huge budget disparity. Like I said, 
One of the two foreign policy legs is extremely strong. Uh, the other one is not. You know, kind of like Popeye and olive oil. It's, uh, it's, it's incredible. So, my closing thought. America truly is at the crossroads. Question, it's an open question. Is our 100 year run as the undisputed globe's leader and premier military and economic power, is it now starting a slow fade, as Britain did after World War II? Or are we starting Act Two as the most dynamic nation for the 21st century, thanks to inspired global leadership built on military strength, economic prosperity, and insightful diplomacy? Luckily, today, it's still our choice, but it won't be much longer. And if I depressed you too much, Don't worry about the world coming to an end today. It's already tomorrow in Australia. Really enjoy it.